everyone welcome to eat the magic escapade edition this is the eat the magic podcast type show with me jared the greek and with me today is eric Higami. hey we are going to be talking about something a little bit different this time around we are talking about the 80s tv special totally midi totally <laughs> You say it. We're talking about Totally Mini. So on this episode of um, Escapades, because it's kind of been quiet in the theme park world right now, we're just going to cover a special that has to do with Disney or something theme park related. So I remember watching this special as a kid. This aired in 1988. We I probably caught it during reruns on the Disney Channel. And the way of how it ties in with theme parks is the opening song and the whole concept of Totally Mini was featured as like one of the um one of the uh, shows for 80s night when we went a couple weeks ago it's like yeah i remember just watching this special as a kid maybe i should just go ahead and revisit it so just kind of recap on 80s night so they had like the section where like they teach where they you just go in they kind of teach you like this dance like oh yeah you're background dancers for minnie's new music video and you had the fab five show up in like 80s variants there's even a photo op zone which shows like the fab five credited as like the music videos um creative crew yeah, you had director Donald, choreographer Goofy, cameraman Pluto. I don't know how you would have a dog be a cameraman, but any that's anyone's guess. We caught a little bit of, bit of it, and they even had the theme song Totally Mini like playing as like um, the dance instructor was telling you just how like do all the dance moves. So like okay, let's uh, revisit again. They tied it into '80s night, so we actually, by the graces of YouTube, um, we found um, the half hour special. On the Weber Nets. And uh, it is very 80s. Like, it it kind hasn't of painfully so. aged well. Like, you would, if you're like in Gen Z or like an earlier, later millennial, uh, you kind of need like cultural notes on like just some of the pop culture references because, like, even in the, in the first like five seconds, you had to explain to me who the beer dog was from the 80s. Yeah, they make a brief reference to Spuds McKenzie. I literally was like, pause this. I went on and looked it up and showed you a little montage of commercials and how cringe those Spuds McKenzie commercials are. Yeah, why are these gals horny for a dog? It is really weird and does not make me want to drink Bud Light. It makes me just look at that and go, that is... Someone was doing way too much cocaine when they came up with that idea. So the concept behind Totally Mini is you have Lewis... Okay, he's given a different name, but he might Max. as well be Lewis from Revenge of the Nerds. Same actor to um, Robert Carradine. is like, I am totally uncool. Look at me. I'm a nerd who wears glasses. Here's my to- my totally nerdy laugh here, which sounds like Eddie Murphy. But Eddie Murphy probably did it after um, Lewis from Revenge of the Nerds. Uh, no. I, it... I forgot what year Revenge of the Nerds well, came out. Well, the weird out. thing is because I think Revenge of the Nerds, I would say 86 or 87. I might be wrong on that. I would say before the special for sure, and I think after Back to the Future, because I think he was modeling his laugh on George McFly's laugh from Back to the Future. That is my theory. Because obviously he's not really a nerdy guy. He's he's a Carradine. He probably knows Kung Fu or something. And his legend will continue. That's a reference that millennials will also not get. I think millennials will get uh, Kung Fu to legend continues. continues. Z's won it though, right? Yeah, but Z's, you kind of have to give them some cultural notes by some hip uh, millennial youtuber to explain that yeah uh, but he basically is playing a character that disney can't say has to change the name of to make him legally distinct because they obviously did not own everything at, back in the 80s because that wasn't eisner's plan wasn't his plan wasn't to buy everything at versus you know whatever that's a whole nother subject um but uh, the whole premise is, yeah, he's, he's like, oh, I'm such a nerd. Look at my, I'm, I trip over stuff and I wear glasses. and uh. I'm wearing plaid. I'm having pocket protectors because I must protect them. And then he sees this advert on TV by Minnie Mouse. Like, yeah, come to my school. It's like nerd rehab because in the 80s, there was like this whole trend like, okay, you got to have a makeover if you wear glasses or if you're not hip. So they use the word hip a lot because Oh 80s. my god. Yeah, it's like every other word. And uh, yeah, it's just following the stereotype of like, oh, you're a big nerd, but if we change your clothes and give you some contacts, now you're no longer a nerd. Everyone will like you if we just remove your glasses, change your fashion, change your awkward conversation topics. I'm like, okay. It was a thing in the 80s. Now, that being said, 
they're not you can fit in better in society with the right clothes and what have you but this and is I kind of like it's a plaid look i i kind of dig the plaid but I, I say this as where i'm wearing plaid pjs um but we will get to when they completely derail the message of this thing at the very end because that's an amazing segment but to continue this the plot and i use the word so loosely this is like talking about a certain movie franchise where when I talk about the plot, there's I'm, a lot of movie franchises. A lot of that quotations around the, that word. That criteria. And there are. That's the reason I kept it vague. So Lewis goes to like Minnie's uh, rehab for nerds. I know you have the formal name for it, but I forgot what it was <laughs> because I'm just you and I just had like sensory overload of like '80s decorations because he goes oh into the school. And then it's, if you played Kingdom Hearts and there's that, is it Castle Oblivion where, where like Organization 13 just chills and stuff? Well, it's one of their bases, yeah. Yeah, one of their bases, like, it's that place in Chain of Memories, but take that and like, let's say if a Rocky who does JoJo's Bizarre Adventures gave it a complete makeover. It is checkerboard floors, it is uh, asymmetrical weird, asymmetrical neons. neon stuff. <laughs> it, it is... The oddest looking tapestries on the walls, it's posters, it's mirrors. It's as if the 80s barfed on something, and that's what you get. And anyone who knows feng shui would probably th not stop throwing up upon seeing the room. Indeed. And then he meets Suzanne Summers, whose name I forgot in this I... special, but I'm just going to call her Suzanne Summers, because mine as well. And they make a joke about that later on, too. Uh, she's playing, like... Attractive 80s lady, which is really easy for her to do, being Suzanne Summers, an attractive 80s lady. For those of you who don't know, Suzanne Summers is an 80s icon. She's a th the gal in the Thigh Master commercial. She did Step by Step, and she was one of the gals in Three's Company. Yeah, the hot one. I only know her, her from um, Step by Step because I watch a lot of TGIF in the 90s, but who didn't? She probably was on some other major show, too, I think. She had, she had a really strong career for a very long time. But yeah, most people our age would probably know her from Step by Step or Thigh Master. We are the elder millennials. Hmm. We wear hoods. I watched Three's Company very, very much when I was single digits of age, so clearly I'm just the oldest person in the room. I am the oldest person in the room. By two years! <laughs> I'm old! So I remember cartoons on Saturday morning. So Lewis meets Suzanne Summers, and I, I do like her outfit. It's, it's tricky. I, I do dig the suspenders, pants, and hat. You have an outfit just like that, by the way. I do. <laughs> I'm a little bit biased here, but... Yeah, she just raided your wardrobe. <laughs> it's easy as Disney bound ever. Okay, well, I, I will use that as a prompt for stuff Leslie K has watched March 2020. Yeah, okay. But she, they then kind of vaguely explain how to be hip and cool by also playing popular 80s songs that are AMV'd to... Uh, Random clips from Disney movies. But before we get there, there's another thing I wanted to bring up. So, as Lewis is watching this commercial, there's like this before and after that Minnie presents. Oh my like, gosh. This is the before. It shows like this African American gentleman with an afro and everything. So Huge afro, by the way. The afro is like two thirds of the picture. I mean, if you were to show it to anyone today, everyone's like, yeah, cool. Froze, froze, froze are cool. But when they show him in his hip version, oh goodness, it looks like a mugshot. I'm trying to figure out the, a way to describe that hair because they basically removed all his hair and gave, they like did it like the straightening thing, and it looks all weird. And they gave it's him like facial hair, and, and then I'm just looking at the hair. before and after. It's like no, the person before looks like he's having fun, he's having a great time, and then like I'm just looking at the after, like why does this look like a bug shot? Yeah, the, the first version of him looks like he should be apologizing for party rocking, and the. Uh, the second version it's, looks it's like... It's Chris Brown, like, in front of the LAPD. Yeah, thank you. That's a good... That is a perfect example. And I'm like, ooh, downgrade. <laughs> now, I know we're looking at this from, like, modern-day eyes, where, yeah, throwback stuff like afros are considered kind of pretty cool. And I agree. Af afros are pretty cool. I cannot grow them because I, I have straight hair. But I wouldn't even find curly hair. I would probably buzz my head like Curly did from the Three Stooges. <sighs> I would not look good with curly hair. No, you would not. My, my dad has curly hair, and I would look very terrible had I inherited that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, that it's just, just kind of weird looking, because this is not aged well. Now, I, I mean, the references, I understand throwing out 80s stuff. There's a lot of references to Bruce Willis, which, I mean, this is the same... It says Bruce Willis 
Before Die Hard, Bruce Willis. Well, Die Hard had just come out or was going to come out later that year. Because uh, it's 88. Because they referenced uh, Bruce Willis when he did uh, Moonlighting. Uh, which he was on. Uh, Sybil Shepherd. Yeah, which he was on after uh, Die Hard as well, I believe. And his singing career, which is... I don't know if he, I don't know if he sang on Moonlighting or not. I do know Bruno predates uh, Moonlighting. But I don't know how many people would freaking know that he was in a band called Bruno. I do know this is, I know this is after Totally Mini. I just totally remember this after taking a break after watching Totally Mini. He was one of the founders, I believe, of Planet Hollywood. Yep. And I remember watching a Disney special where he brought in his, like, his blues band and they actually performed on stage. Yeah. Now I actually do remember uh, that vaguely. And I know he does sing mm. in um, the Thief, Thief movie. He was, I forgot, a Swash Hank or Dem- No. Swash. How can you even can mix those two up? Hudson Hawk. Yes, he sings Swing on a Star because that's how he times, does his crime things is he times them via various songs. So he's like, oh, this will take two minutes and 15 seconds, the same length as says name of song and then sings the song as he does the caper because that's why he can time everything he does. It's actually a very ingenious thing for a movie that like drugs were probably involved. And it's unfortunate because... I kind of like that movie as a kid because it's just silly crime caper movie. But yeah, he, he sang in other stuff. I don't know if he sang in Moonlighting. He probably did. Uh, he still has his band, as far as I know. I don't know if it has the same people in it, but he himself will still tour and do bluesy stuff occasionally. But yeah, again, like just kind of cultural nuts notes. If you're like an, a later millennial slash Gen Z and you kind of want like, hey, let's check out some of the 80s stuff from um, Disney. Kind of need some cultural no- notes here. Yeah, you're, you're going to need uh, an older brother or a parent to sit with you and explain what stuff is. Sorry. It's all right. And then you kind of like just go through like, um, before we go into like the music video segments of the sh- special. Which is 90% of this, by the way. Yes. Um, you also see like, it's like um, Minnie, the an- like Minnie in her animated form just interact with the live action actors which I thought yeah. was pretty cool because like yeah who famed Roger Rabbit and then you also see Donald Duck Pluto just kind of running around the um rehabilitation center for nerds which I believe this predates who framed Roger Rabbit at 88 yes it would so it looks like they were probably experimenting with that technology a little bit although Disney has done the interactions between human and, li- and uh, animation stuff for quite some time I mean, we, we can go back to Mary Poppins and we can go back to various Walt Disney Talks to Disney characters things, which we'll get to that. There's a segment of that which completely derails this entire special. All right. So, um... I'm so hyped about talking about that. I'm sorry. Like, oh, that, was, that was the no, biggest moment of the entire thing. No, wait, I, I am with you with that, but let's just kind of just get through this. So, the way how they teach Lewis how to be hip is to watch a series of animated music videos set to Disney clips, set to popular music of the time. Yeah. And it's kind of cool because it makes you just want to go and find, like, whatever movie certain clips are from. It reminds you, like, I could be watching Silly Symphonies right now. (laughs) Yeah, it does fall in that problem of don't remind people of something they'd rather be watching. Also, just to give you some context, too, because... Of course, this came out before, uh, way before Disney Plus, so it's really hard to acquire, like... A lot of the um, older Disney movies, like, because, you know, they would put them in the vault. specifically put them in the vault. That was his rule. Yeah. And then, like, sometimes this is, like, the only way to, like, really see, like, clips or, like, just a glimpse of, like, old Disney cartoons, old Disney animated movies. Because they also um, interstitch clips from Dumbo, Snow White. Pinocchio. A lot of the older shorts. Uh, They would always show, like, the older shorts, like, on the Disney Channel. So, you would, this is, like, one of the few ways where you can actually watch, like, um, short clips from um, Walt Disney. Now, granted, it's all out of context and you're almost never hearing the original audio. That, that was interesting because they did play clips from the Mortimer Mortimer's introduction and we actually watched that recently for it's some reason. It's on Disney+. Plus. I, I wanted to show you uh, what Mortimer looks like because I actually thought about Disney bounding him out on Villain's Day because, like, hey, obscure villain and um, named after what Mickey was originally going to be named. Yeah. Isn't one of his nephews named Mortimer as well? Or am I wrong on that? I don't know. I just, I think it's like... I thought he had a couple nephews. It might be I wrong. know he has two nephews, and I think their names are Rick and Morty. That is not their names. You're supposed to be the Disney specialist. You're supposed to know this stuff. I'm just the guy who eats food. Tiny Tim? I know they were in the uh, Scrooge Holidays 
Mickey Christmas Carol. Which was great. I can look this up. Mickey. By the way, it was. Mouse nephews. Because they do have statues of them over at the Port Orleans resort over in the shopping place. Cool to ring crowns. Who are Mickey Mouse's nephews? Morty and Ferdy. Oh, Morty. Not Mortimer. Morty. And And the last name is Dot Mouse, but it's Field Mouse. And they were introduced in 1932 in a Mickey Mouse Sunday page storyline called Mickey's Nephews. Oh, so they're just from a comic strip. That's freaking crazy. Mm -hmm. And I remember they went back into my memory when we were staying over at uh, Port Orleans Riverside when we were at the gift shop. Like, oh, wait, who are these two meal mice dudes? Oh, that must be be Mickey's nephews. Rick and Morty, I think? Morty and Ferdy, which would be short for Mortimer and Ferdinand. Mm Mm-hmm. Because the oldie times, everyone had long, crazy names like that. Mor- Ferdinand's kind of a cool name. I'll put that out there. Ferdinand, pretty good. Mortimer doesn't sound great. Like, that doesn't age well, but Ferdinand, if you come on here, like, name's Ferdinand Johnson. Da 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 da. Do 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 do. Like, cop music playing in the background. You throw in your sunglasses. So, a lot of the music videos, the topic they talk about is like, okay, here are just like your lessons to be hip, to be a cool guy. So, one of them is like, okay, don't be a D bag. So, we're going to play uh, Nasty by Janet Jackson, which is pretty much a music video s- dedicated to Pete, the lovable beer cat from Goof Troop, among other things. When he was like a weird pervert guy in like the olden times. And my God, there's a lot of panty shots of Minnie Mouse. Right, but not in that segment. Uh, that was in a different segment. <laughs> that was the one on dancing. Uh, but the, they also have, like, other stuff in there, because they have a part where it shows, like, Grumpy, and then, like, Stomach yeah, that kissing was the Grumpy nasty. Mm-hmm. during Nasty Boys. And I'm like, out of context, this is hilarious. Because <laughs> it's like, that Jan Jackson song, and, like, it's like, this is big some weird implications for Grumpy and uh, Snow White right here. And I think a few other of the handsy dudes from uh, there should have been clips of donald chasing the women in um uh three caballeros in there yes because that was they didn't donald put that in there but man donald donald, donald being horny on duck. maine thirsty duck man <laughs> uh the, the video on like making up which is just more like more on making out honestly <laughs> and it got me thinking because you see like uh, daisy getting angry at donald in one clip you see daisy like you know kissing donald all over his face on another clip and i'm like Daisy and Donald have a very complicated relationship. It's like that Katy Perry song, Hot and Cold. <laughs> it's like, I respect Daisy because Daisy doesn't want to put, put, put up with a Donald's crap as nor, nor she should, should. Nor should she. I mean, that's something I respect about Daisy, like, growing up. But then, like, you also have clips of her, like, just kind of, like, just crying and begging to Donald. Like, no, Daisy, you're, you're better than this. I still need, we still need to catch up with uh, modern DuckTales because I know they did bring her, her back into the picture. Oh, that's good. I do like Sassy Daisy Duck. That is my preferred version I of Daisy I hope she has Duck. modern voice. I prefer, I really love modern voice to Daisy. And it's one of those things where it's just, that just gives me a whole lot of thoughts. I feel like I could do some sort of psychology paper based on the psychology of the relationship of Daisy and Donald. And that's almost like, you're doing a psychology paper based on two cartoon characters. I know, but their relationship is so fascinating to me. So yeah, it's kind of a treat to like even see like this obscure, like silly symphony clips interstitch into music videos. Yeah, and timed very well. I mean, they, they didn't have ask this thing they they took the efforts to make things time well and look nice and the, you and i were at videopolis and i was thinking as we were watching this like it'd be great if they bring back videopolis and also from time to time like have like music music videos set to like disney movies to like 80 songs like as they're it's playing on the screen and as a person who has won awards for doing that well not with disney properties but in general i would gladly love to have that job just give me a huge pile of the back catalog and let me just edit like crazy yeah disney we're giving you ideas here for free so um hi bring us on board we have ideas like even for just the most minuscule things like you and i just yesterday were just talking about a rock and roll rock and roller coaster a goofy movie version well, because the whole uh aerosmith thing is great and all except for aerosmith is not nearly as popular as they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30, 40 years ago at this point. And it needs to get replaced with something, but who are you going to replace it with? And then we're watching the Goofy movie, and I'm like, well, Powerline. 
And Tevin Campbell still records to this day, and he's he's actually done some Broadway work. He was actually in um, Hairspray as um, Seaweed. Yeah. So yeah, this guy's still pretty active, and um, he was over at uh, Burbank to do like a goofy uh, movie tribute not too long ago. Did he really? Yeah, there was like a goofy movie uh, tribute thing, and he could still he still has the uh, power chops too. Well, I mean, if he's doing Broadway, he's, he can he can sing. Mm-hmm. He was uh, Seaweed in um, Hairspray. So. The thing is, you write three new songs for him, so now you have a total of five songs, so you can change it up, and then you just make the premise that Goofy is your uh, a limo driver. And then you also... And that's why you're you're doing loops and going all weird angles. Or your limo driver just so happens to be missing, and Goofy has to be the replace, last minute replacement, Back work and too. then Polly Shore doing the safety spiel. Yeah. Hey, buddies, me and Max are already at the concert, so if you want to get there, make sure to put on your seatbelt and make sure to hook it from the left into the right, buddy. That'd be great. And Polly Shore, I'm sure, can still do the, the buddy voice. Oh, for those who are of our younger listeners, Polly Shore was the son of the owners of the Comedy Store, a popular comedy club in Southern California. He then went off through meeting various other comedians to do a lot of different things, including movies, MTV. Yeah. Oh, MTV was a channel that used to exist. It played and music, it videos, music right? videos, Music videos are videos with a, uh, where you hear a song that's popular with footage at and the same time. And their Twitter at the time did not ban me from commenting on their stuff. And that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I don't MTV be- banned me. <laughs> they blocked me. I love the fact that MTV planned you. We're the rebels, man. Hey, Hi, I think you should like uh, that. That's another thing that's for another, another day. Let's there, let's but... just kind of focus on Dolly Mini Air. Okay, so point out, people, it was not because she was like dropping weird f bombs and racial slurs. It was quite the opposite because they were talking crap about interracial relationships, and I wasn't cool with that. So, uh, but okay, my jokes towards Gen Z aside. One of the things I need to point out here is that I really did like the music video segments. Some of the song choices were interesting. And Neutron Dance was fun. Neutron Dance was great, yeah. But and during the dance section, which was Neutron Dance, uh, there's a lot of mini like showing off her bloomers. And I think it's what those old timey like under girl short type underpants are called. Yeah, bloomers like the because uh yeah because I, I I have made them for like um yield tiny stuff just to be it keep it accurate and cute and it's one of those things where I'm like showing off I mean this is like crazy amounts of this this is dare I say scandalous Ooh, and, panty shots <laughs> and also there's a part where Minnie pulls a gun on Pete I thought that was pretty awesome <laughs> and I'm like man they would never allow that nowadays I do dig cowgirl Minnie. I don't know what that cowgirl mini one was from, but I want to see that. They, they redubbed the line to be like, uh, was it nasty boys aren't hip? And then, you know, pulls the gun on Pete. But I'm like, that's probably not the original line from that. But I do appreciate mini just like going like, no, Pete, I got a gun. You can just back the hell off. Yeah, if anything, those are just kind of like a nice time capsule of like um, old Disney clips and even seeing like some of the more obscure Silly Symphonies. So we saw the uh, moth, uh, moth into the Flame one. Mm. Which you call, like, scary fairies. Because they look like really weird-looking fairies. And I'm like, oh, I haven't seen this in a while. And I did like the design of, like, the main um, moth girl man thing. Mothman. They also, uh, one of them was on Jealousy, uh, which basically was, let's, you know, let's shame Tinkerbell. And uh, out of context clips of uh, Mortar- uh, Mickey versus Mortimer in that short that we watched earlier. It's on wanted, Disney+. Plus. Which is on Disney+. Plus. You can check that out, people. And I can't remember what the other character was who was jealous of stuff. But it was one of those things where I was like, well, okay, that's at least a good message for the kids. You know, don't be a weird creepo with the girls and don't be jealous if your girl is just doing her thing. And I'm like, you know what? Very positive messages right there. There was some good that came out of this. And then we went into the land where Minnie and Elton John have a duet. This is a thing, people. At first, we thought, like, well, was this film over at, like, uh, the Boardwalk Resort uh, or the Yacht Club? Like, no, and it was actually, like, a beach beach. And it was, like, at a pier. Like, it's too small to be Santa Monica, that's for sure. And it was kind of cute. I, I really liked it. And when the f- first time when I was watching this um, 
uh, when I was watching Totally Mini, this was my introduction to Elton John. <laughs> Like, oh, hey, I kind of dig this song. They did a duet, too, Don't Go Breaking My Heart. Mm-hmm. And it's a uh, Rusty Taylor, um, as Minnie Mouse may Rusty Taylor rest in peace. Because I remember when um, Rusty Taylor Taylor had passed last year, I posted the uh, Don't Go Breaking My Heart video. I was like, yeah, this is my intro to Elton John. Thank you, Rusty Taylor. And, like, he wears, like, this, like, pink plaid outfit. And I would consider it sort of tame by Elton John's standards. When you compare it to, like, a lot of his 70s um, concert rock uh, arena stuff, like, I kind of want that outfit. <laughs> and he has, like, the heart-shaped glasses and stuff. It's one of those things where Elton John can pull that off. No one else can. Challenge accepted. No other male can. I don't care how British they are. But, yeah, it was a cute clip. Like, you could find it on, on YouTube. And you also had, like, Mickey a Sorcerer's Apprentice, like, there for, like, a few seconds looking all jealous and stuff. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty pretty hilarious. But yeah, it, I thought it was pretty cute. It's like definitely one of the higher points and the one of the better points of, of the special. It has nothing to do with the plot line. It just cuts away to this music video of the two of them singing that song. And I'm like, okay, we're doing this now. But it is really cute. You check it out, especially if you're a mini fan or an Elton John fan. It's a nice little historical time capsule. You can easily just find that music video online. You don't even have to go and find the whole mini special. And then we cut to, like, uh, Lewis and uh, Suzanne Summers on, like, a practice date. And the area, it's... I know it's not filmed filmed at the Sci-Fi Diner It is one of those place, cars, though. That's clearly one of those prop cars. I got the vibe, like, wait, did they just, like... Because it's... Okay, um, so... 88, so this had to have been before um, MGM Studios, Hollywood Studios, opened. So I'm like, okay, we'll just uh, like use like one of the cars that we're probably going to use for sci-fi d- d- drive-in theater and like just do this whole practice date thing. <laughs> and like, okay, this is kind of awkward. The weird thing is you can tell the two actors have some pretty good chemistry. Like in that scene, like he's trying to play awkward and all, but like the way they work together, I'm like, no, oh, I guess they're kind of cute together. Um, and then they watch like quote movies but it's really just more music videos on the on the screen i think the theme of this one was like how to make up yeah that was the makeup one which i'm like you know when her initial oh, whatever um yeah it was, it was about the first one was like about fighting and then the one was about making up and it was kind of awkward but like the two actors seemed to be having like a really good time like just playing kind of semi-dorky characters in a car but it, it does look like the cars they used for them, and probably was one of them, going like, yeah, we can just use this real quick, we'll shoot it here, and then we can just bring the car into the thing. Because it doesn't look like a real car at all. I mean, it looks like a real car in terms of facade, but in terms of, like, you can tell they didn't just pull up an old Cadillac for them to film in. It's it's clearly a prop Cadillac, if that makes any sense. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if it's that same Cadillac that's actually parked outside of uh, the sci-fi drive theater. It might be, because you can sit in front seat or back seat on that one, so. And there are photos of me on that? Yes, there are photos of you on that. There are photos of me on that. Photos and of you acting like Spider-Man, photos of me acting like a cat. Why was I acting like Spider-Man? Because you were bounding as Spider-Man. Oh, right. I do stuff. And things. And things. And I think that's also the background for the video the review of the sci-fi diners yeah we'll have that video posted like later this week for florida fridays i gotta double check that footage but i think i think you can see it in the background of that one and it probably is the exact same car if you've if you've um ever have never ate at the sci-fi drive-in theater i highly recommend it nice air conditioning (laughs) dine-in theater i think it's called the sci-fi dine-in theater (laughs) Yeah, I, I keep, it's a, it's a mouthful of words, but it is, like, one of our favorite places to dine at Hollywood Studios, or even at the uh, resort, um, Walt Disney World Resort in general. Yeah, it is in the high, high priority for people if you're going there. Really good milkshakes, burgers are pretty decent, and very probably other stuff, stuff on the menu that was pretty good, too. It was very filling, plus it's fun to seeing old trailers to, like, B-movies from the 50s and 60s, and a couple little animated shorts. I would actually like them to extend it to have uh, some extra stuff in there, personally. Or outright just show me some old-timey, like, you know, Martian man-killer women from Mars. You know, more movies like that. All right. So did you want to talk about the fourth wall breaking in um, the, the drive-in? Yeah. So at a certain point, I guess I'm calling him Lewis. His character's name was Max. So let's call him Max. 
uh, Max ends up turning to Suzanne Summers, who probably has a character name, and says, it's really weird. Has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Suzanne Summers? And she just turns to the camera and, and to just the audience. And just like, whoa. A little <laughs> wink to the audience. Yeah. And I'm like, that was cute. That was a little cute little thing there. And like I said, it looked like the two of them were having a blast. Like, you guys have way too good of chemistry to be, like, quote, awkward date. I don't think they were a couple in real life. It's just two actors having to play these roles. But I don't know. I just I saw them. Like, what if you guys ever became a couple? Because you guys have good chemistry. Uh, then they go back in because Lewis needs his makeover. Uh, so shopping montage. So shopping montage. And they, they, they broke one of my key rules. If you do the shopping montage, you have to have a part where the person goes in the dressing room, comes out, and it cuts to someone else shaking their head like, nope. And then they go into the dressing room again, and they come out. The guy goes, nope. And on the third one, they come out, and the guy goes like, thumbs up, or yes, or something like that. But that was kind of cool, because there was also, like, the background it. dancers, like, dressing up in, like, all these, like, totally 80s clothes. Oh, my and God, And when yes. they would, like, when either they would pose or look in the mirror, you would see Minnie Mouse wearing their clothes. Like, hey, I thought that was kind of cute. Yeah. And it kind of allowed them to show off different looks for Minnie and what have you, which I'm sure there was product for. Yeah, there was a lot of product um, t- tying in with Minnie Mouse in the late 80s. I actually own some of that. And that's fine. Let's see, after that... Was after that the Walt Disney segment? segment? Yes, because we're going to talk about the moral of this. But, but however, uh, so Lewis gets his makeover, and then Suzanne Summer, she's like wearing like this 80s Marlene Dietrich kind of look. They're like, yeah, you look hot. And then weird top hat and tails kind of thing. Yeah, which I'm okay with any era. Yeah, no, she looked really good in it. Mm-hmm. And then so Lewis just comes in, no glasses, kind of wearing like all, all these black polyester layers. Like, yeah, of course he'd be hot. He's in layers, girl. Right, she's talking about him looking attractive. Mm-hmm. Because... Robert Carradine or whatever is a decently good looking dude when he's not playing it up as Lewis Tully. And then he's like feeling all mopey. He's like, it doesn't matter what I look like on the outside because, you know, I'll never be a real cool person and da da da. And then it cuts to this old clip of Walt Disney and Donald comes out and he's trying to do all these different things to impress Walt Disney. And Walt Disney just goes, Donald, he pulls up a little, little sign thingy and sets it next to him and goes like, What's this saying? It just says, be yourself. And he's like, he's like, yeah, that's all you got to do. Just be yourself. Everything's going to be fine. Don't, don't, you don't have to go around and trying to impress me or any of that kind of stuff. You're Donald Duck. You're fine. Be yourself. And I'm like, this is a wonderful message for an entire thing thus far that is told to this guy to change his clothes, change his attitude, learn to dance, and uh, don't be too handsy. But if a girl wants it, go for it. Um, and... Uh, and then you're telling him after all that, but who you were originally, that's good too. It's like, wait, what was the point of all this? And, and then if, if that's your conclusion, why does Minnie Mouse have like a rehab center for nerds? Shouldn't Minnie Mouse instead just be going on and giving PSAs about, hey, you don't need to dress a certain way or act a certain way. Just be yourself. That's how to really be hip. And like, shouldn't that just be the one? It just save a lot of money instead of all the overhead that goes into running a facility to help nerds become cool people, but then have them realize, oh my god, I'm a nerd no matter what. Which, by the way, nerd and proud. Um, nerd and proud, Kingdom Hearts, aw yeah. So, that and then just kind of end up that, like, yeah, everything's gonna be okay. The end credits. <laughs> it's like, that Disney thing completely derailed the entire message of this. And it seems bizarre to me, because of the whole thing... If Lewis had been more in that mindset of like, I hate who I am and I don't like being a nerd and this and that and goes through all these steps to then have someone finally, someone who was a character there from the get go, just go, hey, man, being yourself is more important. Stop trying to pretend to be someone else. Be you and people will like you for you. Because, um, for example, on the date section, he starts talking about like how cheese is made, which I'm like, you know what? You know what, buddy? Suzanne Summer's probably not what uh i've okay <laughs> let's go back even further step this i was once told a phrase and i very liked this phrase the phrase is sapiosexual a sapiosexual is someone who's attracted to intelligence someone if you've ever been attracted to like a teacher and it's not just been a physical thing but you're like i just like hearing this teacher talk or um it's a professor jones crush yeah being, being the girl who is crushing on professor jones at the beginning of Indiana jones Girls, plural. Pl- girls, plural. <laughs> That's true, yeah. Most of his class is female. <laughs> I love that scene. Uh, 
that's a sapiosexual. You're, you're attracted to that intellect. If they're good looking on top of that, always a bonus. But it's that intellect you really like. It's, it's being able to have a conversation with someone. It's being able to learn something from someone. It's being able to just see them show off how intelligent they are. It's a good thing. And from a somewhat hetero female perspective, eh, you know, I'm bi, whatever. Um, I like hearing like just details and like and stuff like that. <laughs> So when I see that scene, I'm like, look, she might not be down with that, but there's plenty of women who would be fascinated to know how cheese is made and the scientific like composition of cheese. I mean, not so much uh, cheese, but like, let's talk history. Let's talk about like my new minutia in history. Like, I'm down with that. Uh, you want to talk about analyzing Kingdom Hearts? Go for it. So it's one of those things where I'm like, dude, dude. Buddy, there's plenty of sapio women out there who would be super down with this. Maybe not exactly this subject matter, but this is a sign that you clearly know stuff about chemistry, and I'm sure there's plenty of conversations about chemistry, food science, etc., that women would be fascinated by. Oh, believe me, like, I'm always intrigued to hear about the uh, science behind skincare and makeup. Yeah. And I'm sure he could le learn that as well. I mean, he seems like a fairly smart character. That's what he's supposed to be. So my point is... There are women who would be attracted to him. Hell, that was the whole damn point of Revenge of the Nerds. I mean, granted, how he got his girlfriend in that one is a little messed up. Incredibly messed up and wrong, and do not do that. If that is your methodology for getting women to date you, do not do that. You should go to jail. But <laughs> the fact that she stayed with him, she stayed with him because she liked how smart he was and how kind he was. Well, you know, those traits that go beyond what he looks like. Because being of a dumb jock isn't entirely fun for women after a while, I'm sure. Preach. So it, it, it's one of those ones where I, I like that message of be yourself and, and express yourself in fun ways. But there was definitely better ways of getting that message across than the way they did it. And that's unfortunate because it's, it's a good message to tell kids. You know, be yourself, be true to you, and things will work out. You know, you'll, you'll find friends who are into the same stuff you're into. And if only we could achieve that as adults. Oh, no kidding. Heck, that, that's half of a, a recent report I had to do on a, on or OrcCon. I made reference to the fact that you could meet tons of good friends here. How many friends did you made at OrcCon? Zero. But it's not the point. I feel like you could make friends at OrcCon if you're into, you know, board gaming and stuff. And okay. the anime cons, for that matter, I always say the con, like, they're a great place to meet new people and make friends, because I met a lot of friends at those events, and now not so much, but, but back in the day. But you know what? We got Adventureland Day coming up next week, so we'll also be doing a show on that. Uh, if you see us at Adventureland Day, say hi to us. I'll be wearing a, an outfit that I'll be making um, for the event, including a patch that I'll be wearing close to my heart, representing what I represent. And I'll find some clothes the day before or the morning of and put them on. Well, you're going to have to, like, figure that out on Friday because we're driving up to my parents' house. Or my parents' house, we're driving to Disney. You'll figure it out. Uh, we're going to just do your professor look again. Uh, just got a pith helmet. It's true vintage. And if only there was some sort of, like, hip mouse who could explain to me, like, clothes and stuff. I mean, there's plenty of mice up in the attic. You want to ask them? No, let's not do that. All right, Jay, take us out. All right, so if you see us at Adventureland Day, say hello, give me suggestions for food to eat, and if you're very nice, I'll even let you pop up in one of my videos. I've done that before for other people. It's true. And until then, remember, folks, go to the parks and eat the magic. Stay tuned for our Florida Friday video on the Sci-Fi Drive-In Movie Theater.